there's a little story to the title. I didn't want that title. When we were writing the pilot episode, they, we needed a working title. And I had told the story about my brother being a police officer and this kind of humorous jealousy between us. And he would come home and he would see like an award I got from the cable ace people, whatever it was, <laughs> I don't know. And he would compare our two lives and he goes, look at, look at this, I go to work, you know, people shoot at me. People yell at me, people curse at me. And Raymond goes to work and everybody loves Raymond. Yes. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Janelle Riley. I'm an editor at Variety. I am so thrilled to be here today for this conversation with Ray Romano. Um, easily one of our best comedians of all time. He's also emerged as a fantastic actor and writer and now director, thanks to his debut film, Somewhere in Queens. He is, of course, a SAG Award winner and a 14-time nominee. Please welcome Ray Romano. Hey, everybody, how are you? Oh. By the way, am I a 14-time nominee? In, you are, because... In, uh, in what? In SAG? Big SIC, SAG? Big SIC Ensemble. Um, many multiple nominations for Everybody Loves Raymond, including We're ensemble SAG nominations. Award. SAG, yes. The SAG Award. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, this is SAG, so, so we're celebrating SAG. No, I know it's SAG. We can go into all your Emmys, too, if you want. I have a funny story about SAG. Please. The, the SAG Award. If, uh, when my twins, uh, I have twin boys, and so when they were like seven or eight, so I had won the SAG Award, right? So at home, I had, I'm, I'm going to sound like I'm patting myself on the back, I'm not. <laughs> I had I had an Emmy, I had a Golden Globe, I had a SAG, but the SAG was very heavy, right? And so my boys would pick it up and go, wow, it's heavy. And then one day, they were on a tour at Warner Brothers, uh, with one of our neighbors worked there, so they went with his son and they went on a tour with other people, the, the public, and they got to, <laughs> and they got to the award place, you know, and and the guy, the the the, the tour guide was saying, so <clears throat> this is the Emmy, da 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 da, da. it weighs four point five pounds, and my little kids from the back went, SAG Awards heavier, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know why I know this, but I believe the SAG Award weighs 13 pounds. It's yes. a heavy one. It's yeah. a heavy one, yeah. I yeah. remember, I have a very vivid memory of being backstage when Renelle, Renee Zellweger won for um, Chicago Actress and Ensemble, and she was working those like weights. She had one in yeah. each arm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, they're the heaviest award, yeah. Yes. I haven't felt one in a while, but they're the heaviest, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, actually, because this is a SAG after audience, I always love to start by asking, how did you get your SAG card? Well, my first gig was news radio, but I got fired from right. that. So I, I got fired on the second day of rehearsal. So I don't know if I technically got it there. Probably no. not. So it has to yeah. be Raymond. It has to be. Wow, really? Yeah, because it was, I got fired from news radio and six months later, I had the development deal wow. to do, to find, you know, to, to get a sitcom, uh, Worldwide Pants signed me to a development deal, and that became Raymond. I guess. I'm, yeah, I'm, no, I'm, I think that makes sense. Right? Yeah. Because yeah, um, it wouldn't be for like Dr. Katz or something like that. That no, was voiceover. No, yeah. no, Dr. Katz was, yeah, just a boy animated, yeah. Uh, yeah. I actually, I want to talk about the firing, if you don't mind, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Hey, no, it worked out mind. okay. Um, but actually, no. I want to go back to the beginning. It real worked quick. out for both of us, because I don't know if you know. I got fired from, new, do you remember the show News Radio? Oh, yes. Yeah. So I got, I was doing stand-up at the time. I got called into audition for it by the, the showrunner, Paul Sims, and he loved me. And then he flew me to L.A., and we, we did it in front of the network. We had a network read, and it went almost as well as the, but not quite. And then the table read, they, so, but they hired me anyway because he pushed me in, and the table read, went a little less at each at each stage i could feel I, I i'm being honest now i felt like i was in over my head i felt like i wasn't quite ready and um and then we went to rehearsal and on day two of rehearsal 
my uh, phone rang in the hotel. My family was in New York, you know, and we were all excited. You know, I'm on a show. I'm going to make, I, I think I was getting $8,000 an episode, you know, which was tremendous. It is tremendous still. But w my wife and I were going crazy. Um, you know, we had three little kids, and I was a stand-up, working stand-up, living paycheck to paycheck. And then my phone rang at 6 30 in the morning in the hotel for day two, and as soon it was my as soon as I picked up my hello and it was my manager and I knew immediately, oh. I knew because I felt it in my gut. I did feel it in my gut. But the actor who took my place, do you know who took my place? I do. Joe Rogan. Yep. So we've both done okay. <laughs> we've both done okay. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. yeah, you were you were hired to be the electrician handyman character. I was yes yeah. yes. Originally I was hired to be a, a suit and tie guy, I didn't know that. and after the table read. They came in and said, hey, we're changing. Yeah, see, that, see, they knew. They, they knew. Oh, wow. They said, we're making it. You're going to be like the janitor guy. All right, all right. And then the third day, they said, you're going to be Joe Rogan. <laughs> 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 yeah. That's weird, because that role might not exist without you for Joe Rogan. Because it's if it was supposed yeah. to be a suit and tie person. Yeah, it was so supposed to be a, an office guy. He yeah. should be giving you twenty percent, frankly. Yeah, well, it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> yeah. He was a stand-up too. He was a working yeah. stand-up at the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. But sort of, uh, I mean, was that your first big audition for something and first like job landing? I mean, I was a stand-up working in New York, um, and I would go on the road. I was making a living doing stand-up. It was my eleventh year in stand-up. And I would get auditions. I, I was taking acting classes there. There was a teacher there who gave acting. She was a, an acting teacher, but she had a specific class just for stand-ups. So we all did it. I did it with uh, a couple of stand I did Louis C.K. with the John Stewart, whatever, Dave Attell. Um, and I would occasionally, guys would see me on the HBO comedian special or this special, and they would call me in. I didn't have an agent. But I would get called in to my ma my manager, said, "Hey, he saw you on this. He wants you to read for this part." And I would be terrified. I would go in and read, and at, this was the one read where this guy, everything clicked during the audition. Yeah. And you know, if you're an actor, you know you can you can hit it out of the park in an audition sometimes, and doesn't mean you're really right for the role already. And and I I just wasn't. I, I felt it. I really. I'm not going to say I was relieved. But when he told me, my, my manager told me that morning, they're going in another direction. And that's exactly what they said. It's exactly what he said. And I was like, where are they going? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, but there was a sense of relief. There yeah. was a sense of relief. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then when Raymond came, uh, they were smart and they got me an acting coach. <laughs> yeah, they did. For no. the first two seasons, I had an acting coach, yeah. Well, I, I am curious because I don't know what you sort of thought your career would be. Did you think, I don't want to say just stand up, because stand up is, in, in my opinion, the most scary thing you can do yeah. as a performer. But did you always want to branch out into acting? Yeah, you know, when I, my first experience with performing at all was not stand up, it was acting. It was, uh, in college, I took drama, whatever, and we put on, you know, scenes. And um, so I, I had that little bit of that bug. And then when I fell in love with stand-up, it became all stand-up. And then, and I didn't even know if I could do that. And it took a while. It, it's a grind. It's a grind to, to find out you can do it. And then, you know, by the time I was making a living doing it, and when I got into my 11th year, it was when a lot of stand-ups were getting the gigs. We're getting, mm -hmm. you know, Tim Allen, Roseanne, Seinfeld. And I thought, well, if the next step would be this, if this came along. And I thought at the time, you know, I've done, I had done the HBO Young Comedian special. I had done T Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Wow. I did The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. I did Conan. I did all the shows. And I thought, you know, if somebody hasn't seen me by now, I don't know, if they don't want me, you know, and nobody wanted me, and for that, for that, you know, because they were giving out development deals to, yeah. to stand-ups, but it was Letterman, it was my, I did my first Letterman, and Letterman, uh, the Letterman people called that weekend, I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding, they called on a Saturday, Rob Burnett called my house in Queens on a Saturday, and said, hey, we just want you to know Dave loved what he saw, he, he, he's talking about you, and we, we really want to talk about signing you to a development deal. So if anyone else makes an offer, come, you know, let us talk to you first. 
And I said, no, <laughs> there's nobody else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't tell them that. Yeah, yeah. But that was it. We're white pants. It was David wow. Letterman. And, we, and then we, you know, I had to find Phil Rosenthal. I mean, a lot of things had to happen. Right, yeah. I want to come back to that, but um, did you do plays in high school or anything like that? I did a couple little stupid things, you know. Well, they're all stupid in high school. Yeah, yeah. We're, all, we're drawing lines on our forehead to yeah. do arsenic and old lace. I remember a church uh, in my neighborhood put on... Um, it was called The King is a Fink, and it was based on um, uh, Hagger the Horrible, maybe, or The Wizard of Id. Was The Wizard of Id a, a cartoon? Yes. Yeah. It yes. was, right? Yeah, so it was based on that, and I played, like, the, the jester. The, the really? jester, Yeah, um, and that was a good experience. And then our, the church in my neighborhood had a teen club, so they're trying to get the teens off the streets, and they, they, every Sunday night, they would, you were allowed to go into the church basement where they had ping pong and knock hockey and a stage and whatever. And me and a couple of the funny guys in my neighborhood thought, this is when the Saturday Night Live had come mm -hmm. out, and we thought, let's do a sketch show. Let's do our own sketch show. And uh, we called ourselves No Talent Incorporated. <laughs> yeah, and we said, we're going to put on a No Talent show. And that's what we did for the, and for all the, kids you know yeah. the teenagers and we wrote our own sketches we did our own thing you know it was kind of put together uh, you know sloppily but it went over really great and I got the bug up there too that's where I got the bug a little bit that's so, what I was going to ask yeah. if that's what led to stand-up comedy yeah I actually did one of the sketches I came out and and did a little bit of stand-up actually you know I it wasn't my own I, I stole it from a book or something oh sure jokes, you know but I did, I did get the bug then, yeah. Because I also understand you went to high school with Fran Drescher, SAG after president. Yes, I didn't know it. Oh, you I didn't, didn't know okay. it. We were in the same graduating class in Hillcrest High School. And I had never met her. I had, I had heard her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, was it a big school? It was a pretty big okay. school. It was, uh, yeah, anybody know Hillcrest High School? And do, do you really? Oh yeah, yeah. It was in uh, Jamaica, right? Is it? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That was where I, I went there one year. I went, oh, I went, I graduated from that. I got kicked out of two other schools. Did you really? I went to what? Thomas Edison. You know Thomas Edison, because yeah. that was the Jamaica High School. Yeah, right across the street. Yeah, yeah. Thomas Edison. I went the first, and the first one was Archbishop Malloy, which was a an old boys Catholic school, and I got kicked out of that one. Yeah. What did you do? Oh, I just. You know, it was no, I didn't. I just didn't study. I just oh. it was academic. Oh, okay. It was academic. I just was a lazy, uh, irresponsible kid, and uh, you know, I set the gym on fire. But no, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> no, I didn't. It was all See, academic. You failed three subjects in in really? law. You can't go back. You fail your. They had shop classes in Thomas Edison, and if you fail your shop class, that's like your major. You can't go back. Yeah. You failed shop. Well, no, it's your. It's kind of like your major it was mechanical drawing okay. for me. Yeah. Um, and I failed that. And then Hillcrest took me in. And Hillcrest was the first one where I had a creative writing class. It was kind of a, a progressive uh, school. And um, that's where Fran Drescher, yeah, I found out that Fran wow. Drescher was there. Yeah. And then she, we did, I did a guest spot on her show. Yes. Once we found that out, yeah. Uh, we actually quite have a question from the audience, from Kathy. Can you tell us a bit about your childhood, some funny or interesting moments, and when did you realize you had a talent for making people laugh? Um, well, I mean, like I said in my childhood, we had a group of us. I wasn't, you know, I, I hear this a lot, and this is easy to believe, but for me it is. I was not the funniest kid in my neighborhood. That was a kid called uh, John Oliver. Not, oh, not, not God. that John Oliver. No, <laughs> the accent is fake. I no, know it. Not He's that from John Queens. <laughs> not that John Oliver. But it, it was, it was name was John Oliver. And we all thought this kid's, this guy yeah. is going to be a star. And uh, you know, then you get older and people go their different ways. And and I, I haven't really talked to him. I know he lives in Pittsburgh now. Um, but um, but we started this No Talent Incorporated, and and you know that's that's when I got the bug. It was I think in grammar school. I, I probably got in trouble a little too much because I, I tried to be funny and be, mm -hmm. the, be the class clown a little bit. Um, but I always gravitated towards comedy. You know, I used to work in um, 
a, a movie theater. I was an usher at the Cinemart Movie Theater in Queens. And it was, you know, we're talking way back before, be, well, you guys were around, but before yeah. they were, <laughs> not, not, just barely. You were just barely around. Uh, but it was one big theater. And I remember uh, the, the movie they had was um, Prisoner of Second Avenue, or Neil Simon. Oh, yeah. Yes. Jack Lemmon. Yes, and I and I was in love with uh, comedy, and I as an usher, I knew exactly the point in the film. Oh, this is a big laugh, and I remember I'd be sweeping up here, and I, and I go, well, I got to go inside and listen to the audience during this laugh, and I would come back and go back, you know, and and yeah, so that influenced me a lot too, just the enjoyment of hearing people laugh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I also seem to recall hearing that you did Star Search. I missed Star Search. I was just thinking about yeah. this the other day. How'd you do on that? <laughs> <laughs> I got, um, I don't know if you know, Star, remember Star Search? Yeah. But you're, okay, so if you, you do, you remember the scoring system. Kind it of, was, it was like one to four. It was, yes. It was, you either got a one, two, three, or four. Yes. And there were three judges, I think? Maybe four, I forget. You would get a, Two, if you just said your name right, you know what I mean? It was like the SATs almost. It was hard to get below a two. Mm -hmm. So if you got a two, 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 two from this judge, two from that, two from that judge, you, you, they show your average score yeah. as a two. And I, I got a, my average was a 1.75. <gasps> yeah. Are you serious? Yeah, I got two, two, one. And I lost to a comedian who sadly, he, he actually passed away this year. His name was Geechee Guy. Ichi guy, and he was just a, a machine. He, I yeah. mean, he was going for his sixth win in a row, and I know you can't, you can't repeat your material. So yes. the sixth time in a row, I was thinking, oh, he has to be out of material. Yeah, yeah. He wasn't out of material. Yeah. <gasps> wow. Do you remember the judge who gave you the one? I don't. I don't. <laughs> but I, I do. There is a little side story. When I was living in New York, when that came, when Star Search came, and my wife was pregnant with our first child. And she wasn't due for three, at least three to four weeks. So I flew out to LA with my manager to do Star Search. Uh, and then if you win, you stay yes. because you're, the, you're on the following week. But the, you know, they film it a couple days later, whatever. Um, and so we lost. And my, we were scheduled to stay two or three days anyway. And I was kind of bummed out, and I said to my manager, let's just go back home, yeah. is that all right? He goes, yeah, we flew back home. And so we flew back home, and I got home, and my wife's, the, her water broke as soon as I got home, so, and she had the baby that day, so it was kind of a blessing that yes. I, yeah, I got to go. But here's the horrible part of the story. <laughs> <laughs> During, we, they were born at a hospital in Manhattan, we were living in Queens, and so I went back and forth, and like on the second night, when I went back in, um, they were they were there for a couple of nights. The kids, uh, the, 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 I'm, I'm thinking of my twins, my daughter. Um, and on the way home, I stopped at the comedy cellar. On the way home, and I went into the comedy cellar, and I saw another comedian, Mike Sweeney, and he looked at me. And as soon as I came in, he said, "Congratulations, Ray." And I said, "Oh no, didn't you hear? I lost." He goes, "The baby, you idiot." <laughs> 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 oh yeah, thank you, thank you for that. <laughs> oh my God, Star Search yeah. was such a weird show because they also had a spokesmodel category, yeah. and then they had they had an acting yeah, category an acting where category, people would yeah. do the same scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you should have signed yeah. up for the acting one. Well, well, it was a little too early for that. Yeah. <laughs> but here's the reason: if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna, listen, anything can happen. Uh, uh, me getting a 1.75. <laughs> If I'm going to defend myself at all, you have 90 seconds. No, it's terrible. And, yeah. and Geechee Guy was a, a joke guy. He was one, one line, one line, one line. And my, I kind of talk a little, yeah. you know? It takes me 60 seconds just to say hello there, you know? So it wasn't really fit for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You don't have to justify yourself yeah, anymore. Yeah, yeah, it worked yeah. out, but okay. It's fine, it's fine. <laughs> so News Radio was your first big uh, job. Had you been auditioning for some time then, or was it also one of your first auditions? No, no. That, I, I, I didn't have an agent. I was just going on sporadic auditions when people would see me on, on, a, yeah. TV, on a comedy special or something. So no, I wasn't going out regularly. And so I was green. I was mm -hmm. very green. And when I got, when news, the, again, another 
blessing to news radio was I got an agent then. Right after that is is an agent signed me because I had to have an agent to you know to do the deal for me and all that. So I did finally get an agent then, and and six months later I got the TV show. Yeah. And he kept you even when you were fired from news radio. No, he. Oh yes, he did. He okay. Did. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I got him to, for the deal. I got fired, and I stayed with him. I, I actually went out. Yeah, I got fired in December. This was a, a pilot that shot in December. Wow. And we all knew it was going to get picked up because it was NBC. Yep. It was um, uh, Jim Burroughs directing it, who's the guy. You know, it was Andy Dick, Phil Hartman, Ma- Maura Tierney, um, Dave Foley. We knew this was, show yeah. was getting on the air. Um, and then I got fired, but I got the agent. So then, uh, pilot season, when there was a real pilot season, then was like January, February. So I came back out in January and February and just stayed for pilot season. And then I went on a handful oh, okay. of auditions. And that's where I actually met Kevin James, and me and Kevin James became buddies because we, we were both out there for a pilot. The, yeah. Both comics who were green at acting. And we stayed in the same hotel and, and, and got rejected by all our auditions <laughs> together. Yeah. Well, I, I am curious because you've created so much of your own work. And obviously, Raymond was, was such a hit um, before you started you know, really going into movies. I don't know if you had to audition much or if you, know, you ever developed a talent for it. Because like you said, it's very different. Than... Yeah. It was hard for me. Yeah. I was never that comfortable in the audition. Um, and I was always better at home. And, <laughs> and the, the, I, I, you know, it's interesting because I got Raymond. So did I have to audition for anything? I, I, I had to meet, you know, I had to meet directors who, uh, you know, who were considering me. And then I did have to go on tape for a couple things. And that to me was, the, was much easier mm-hmm. because then I, I just did it until I thought I had it. And that's how I got, I don't want to jump ahead, but that's how I got Scorsese and Scorsese's thing. I went on tape, yeah. Oh, wow. And he saw me on tape, yeah. Was that the last time you auditioned, Vinyl? That's the last time yeah. I've, I've, I've auditioned, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. once Scorsese says yes, you probably well, shouldn't yeah. have to. And the cool thing about that was I go on tape and we send it in and the response we get back is uh, from the casting agent was... Um, He's in the running. Uh, Marty likes what he sees, and he wanted to know who is he. He's never <laughs> here, here, yeah. And and so my agent said, "So yeah. you mean he's never seen the show, uh, any of the, any of his shows?" And he said, "No, he doesn't even doesn't even know who he is," which really was a blessing because yeah. he didn't have to erase the sitcom yeah. guy out of his head. So just what he saw, he liked, which. Which was good, but then it became scary because then for the Irishman, he just cast me because he he yep. kind of liked me, and that is frightening because I didn't I didn't show him anything on tape. I didn't show him here's what I'm going to do with this character. Mm-hmm. So that terrified me even more. Vinyl, he saw what I was going to do. Okay, I'm going to do that. Irishman, he's like, well, I know you're good, so you can do this. Right. I go, well, I don't know if I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Another SAG nomination for Irishman, by the way, so it turned out okay. For the movie. Yes, Not and you, you're part of the ensemble. Oh, for the ensemble, yeah, 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 for the ensemble, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I actually don't, I, it's strange that I don't know this because I'm such a fan of Everybody Loves Raymond, but how did you sort of, when you found out you had this development deal, and a lot of times those don't go anywhere, yeah. um, how did you sort of go about crafting what the show would be and finding Phil Rosenthal? Well, um, they said, you know, we, we like w- your persona, what was on stage, and let's try to develop a show around that. And they sent me to L.A. to have lunch or a meeting with about 10 to 12 different writers, potential showrunners. So I met with them all. Um, I can't remember a lot of their names. I do remember... Um, I narrowed it down to two. I narrowed it down to Phil Rosenthal, who I had a rapport with, and um, Borkow. Borkow was his name. Shit, I'm forgetting his first name. Anyway, 
he was a writer on Friends mm. at the time. And Friends was, yeah, you know, they were the Beatles then. You know? I mean, it was like the third season, I think, of Friends. Um, I forget his first name. Why do I forget his first name? Anyway, was it Andy? No. No. No, I'm just going to throw out names. Borkow, Bob, Borkow, Jim, Borkow. Sam. You can Google it. Somebody can Google it. A writer on Friends. Um, and I went with him. I went with Borkow. He was the, it was the sexier choice. He, he wasn't married. He didn't have kids, you know, which Phil and I both yeah. had in common. Um, but he was a guy, an alpha male kind of guy, and I, I thought he was cool, and he was funny. And I, I might have been influenced by that. Yeah, you know, And sure. I went with him. I chose him when the, probably the smarter choice was Phil, but he then turned it down. He turned it down. Yeah. So, really? uh, so Phil was by default the guy. <laughs> well. and, I, and I can honestly say if that doesn't happen, I don't think we're here yeah. right now. I really yeah. don't think so because Phil was the perfect counterpart. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fairness, not by default, he beat eight other guys. Mm, um, taking nothing away from Borkow. He yes. was a good writer. Yeah, yeah. But it's but not isn't the same crazy? show. It's not the same thing. The dynamic, yeah. Phil, I assume Phil knows this, by the way. This oh, yeah. Is, okay. I, I bring it up every time I see him. Yeah. Do you really? Oh, yeah. We talk about it. We laugh about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah I love that, that, that you continue to be friends and, and kind of collaborators. He's always trying to get you on TikTok and trying to explain. What, what what those apps are and things and it's it's like yeah. it's like a sequel to Raymond in some yeah, ways. Yeah, we we said we're close. I saw him last night, Phil. Oh no way! We had dinner with um, not to name drop, <laughs> but one of the property brothers. <gasps> Which one? Drew. Okay, the good one. Is he the good yeah, one? I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know them. Tell, I can't tell them apart. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't know if you know the property brothers. They're yeah. twins. Who oh do that. yeah. Yeah. Uh, we had dinner with him last night, and and Phil and I and our family's vacation uh, yes. Christmas, we we go away for a week every year. We still do that, yeah. Yes, he gave me a wonderful recommendation in Cabo, and I. Well, he's the guy. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was he, the here's foodie the thing. place. Here's I don't know. Do do all of you know Phil Rosenthal? Do you know who I'm talking yeah. about? Yeah. Yeah. Who doesn't? Raise your hand if you don't know. Okay. Celebrity Wheel of Fortune winner. But also the Phil new Rosenthal. show, the show he has. Yes. Somebody feed Phil. Um. And, you know, he is living, if you have to pick a guy who's living his dream life, because he's a foodie, yep. he loves to travel, he loves people, and he wanted to be Raymond. <laughs> he, he, not, not me, but yeah, yeah. He's, a, he's an actor. He started out oh, acting. I know that. So he wanted to be on camera, too. So now he has all of that. So, <sighs> and now we go to a restaurant, when me and him go to a yeah. restaurant... It's a little humbling, but people come right by me to get his picture in a restaurant only because <laughs> <laughs> not only, not only, but especially yeah. in a restaurant oh, because sure. he's the guy, he's the food guy. No. And he, no matter where I am in the world, I can call him up and say, where should I go to eat tonight? Yeah. And he will know. Yeah. yeah. He gave me a wonderful recommendation for my birthday in Cabo, but then um, it was a cruise and they wouldn't let us dock. In oh, Cabo, really? we couldn't yeah. get off the boat, yeah. and I was like, "But Phil Rosenthal recommended." Well, that's this place. what's cool about going on a week vacation with him. Yeah, is I don't, I, we don't have to worry about planning any dinner. We just go, "Where are we going tonight, Phil?" And he takes us. Yeah. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah. So, when it came to um, putting together the ensemble of Raymond, were you involved in the casting as well? I was involved in the sense that I read with everybody. I gave my opinion, but at that time, I was show nobody. Yeah. You know, and so I, if I disagreed, I really, I mean, Phil and I both had a strong opinion about the wife and the network wanted this one actress and we both said, no, she's wrong. And, you know, he spoke up for both of us. And if they insisted on it, then we, we would have had it done it. But they, they deferred to us, thank God. But they told me about Brad Garrett. Yeah. They said... Uh, we, I didn't read with him. They said, we cast your brother, Brad Garrett. And all I knew from Brad Garrett was he won the very first year of Star Search. That's right. right. He was the yes. grand champion of, yes. Um, has anybody ever seen him do stand-up? Mm -hmm. Because he's, he, he's not the Robert from yeah. TV. No. He's At Don all. Rickles. He's Don Rickles yes. without the warmth. Uh, <laughs> but I'm saying that in a great way. He's the funniest... <laughs> He, he's a true friend of mine. Yeah. I mean, they're all friends. 
but I saw him, I, I performed in Vegas uh, two weeks ago, and he, he has a comedy club in Vegas, mm -hmm. and he did a walk-on. He came out during the Q&A as a surprise guest. I knew he was coming out, but the crowd went nuts. But um, So they told me they cast him, and all I knew was this six-foot-eight giant. He's six-foot-eight, by the way, um, and Jewish, so that's a world's record. Uh, I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm not going to get canceled, am I? For that? Yeah. Okay. All right. He not for that. He does that joke. But anyway, um, he. Uh, they told me they cast him, and and the show was written around my family. Yeah. And my brother really is it was a, at that time still was a New York City police officer, and he's he's shorter than me, and he doesn't have that quality that yeah. that hang dog kind of thing. So we got, that's a lucky thing. I, first I was like, really, Brad Garrett? And then they said, you gotta see what he does, the way he can turn a line yeah. and just, so that's one of the lucky accidents that has to happen. You know, an actor comes in and, and I will say, Phil and I will both admit, we didn't write that character the way Brad brought really? it in. Yeah, yeah. That's what's so interesting, though, especially on shows that run a long time. You start writing for them, or, or they surprise you in ways that you oh, didn't yeah. expect. Yeah, they evolve. They, they, the actor finds the character himself also. You know? Was the chemistry pretty instantaneous with that cast? I, I would say, yeah. Uh, um, with us, it was. With the audience, you know, nobody knew the show. Yeah. So the live audience that came in in the beginning, and this is going to sound like a, a joke, but it isn't, they would bus in to fill up the audience. First of all, they would pay people $50 to come and, well, yes. Really? And then they would bus in people from senior citizens' homes. <laughs> yes, I'm not kidding. And I, I heard even rehab facilities. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm not kidding. So the first couple weeks... It was rough because we knew we wanted to write character-driven yeah. comedy. We didn't write, want to write set-up punchline. You know, when, when, when Doris, when, uh, Dor when Marie comes in the room and it's going to cause friction, you have to know the characters mm -hmm. for, for that dynamic to be real. And nobody knew the characters, so we had to just trust that what we were doing was, was right. And then, you know... By the time we filmed our sixth episode, the show started airing. And after one or two weeks, then we would get people coming in who knew the character, and it would get a little better and a little better and a little better. And, um, you know, so I would think, I think the chemistry with the actors were, were there, but, but still the actors were finding, yeah. finding their, their character. I was, I'm going to uh, embarrass myself now, recently, I might have told you this on the last interview we did, but recently, I don't know if I was having a end of midlife crisis <laughs> or beginning of end of life crisis, <laughs> but I watched every single episode. Yeah. What? And not in, well, in a row, not in a row, but I would, I, 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 one day, first of all, it's been 15 years yep. since I watched an episode. So to watch one completely and sit, I got to, see it from a different perspective. It, it was like another lifetime, and I got to appreciate it uh, differently. When I was doing it and watching it, 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 was, yeah. it was not easy sometimes, you know? Oh, that choice, oh, we edited, oh, why did we go with that line? Oh, uh, that didn't go. So I watched every one, I started watching, and I said, you know what, I'm gonna watch every one, and I'm gonna rate each one of them. Yes. One to four? Yes, no, <laughs> zero, to 100, zero to 100, zero to 100. Oh, I see, rank them. Now, just, to prove I'm not a super narcissist, 91 was the highest I gave anyone, okay? And no one got higher than, not one episode got higher than a 91. I was hard on them. Um, but I did appreciate, first of all, I sucked in year one. In I the don't first, think that's true. In, in my opinion. Uh, the first 10 episodes, I can see where I'm not as comfortable as I was later on. Um, and I can see I'm a little stiff, I'm a little monotone, and I'm not... I'm not there. Um, uh, but I, what happened when I watched again was just seeing how good each one of those, mm -hmm. you know, Doris was and Peter was and Patty, especially Patty Heaton, you know, how, how the, the, just the nuance of it I watched, yeah. But I did, I watched every episode and I rated them all, yeah. 
Yeah. That actually leads to a question from um, Lenny McDonald. Like, am uh, I in therapy? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I am. Yeah. The episode Golfing for Mom is one of my favorites, especially the physical comedy. I got a high mark. I got a high mark. Okay. What was, <laughs> where was it ranked? Three, four, somewhere in there? No, no. They're one to a hundred. Remember? No, oh, wait. So a hundred is the best? I gave them a grade. I gave them a grade. I didn't oh, give them. You didn't I didn't. Rank. I didn't rank them. Okay. I gave them a grade. Because that ninety-one would be was the highest grade that one got. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. That was that. That was in a. That was a ninety at least. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, wants to know what is one of your favorite episodes and why. That's one of them. I mean, you're talking about the one. Who who, who asked that question? You're oh, talking about the right. one where we sleep overnight waiting for Beth Page. Yeah. Great physical comedy. Yeah, and that, that was a great scene. That was like an eleven-minute scene that me and Brad, Brad and I did. Um, yes, um, that's one of my favorites episodes. And then another one is really Brad heavy. Also, is where he dates a, a woman who eats a fly. I don't know if you know that one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I now I'm just I'm just full disclosure. I half wrote that yeah. episode. And it was based on my brother's, my my brother in real life was uh, single, so was divorced, and so he was kind of living, a dating life, especially mm -hmm. when once my show came on the air. He, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and he would tell us stories, and he and he had a story of a woman that he really connected with, and they went back to her apartment and. It wasn't frogs all over, it was snakes. She had snakes all over. Wow. And he's a little bit neurotic like I am. And when she went to the bathroom, he freaked out and he went out the window. He went out the window, yeah. yeah. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm honest to God, truth. But, but I had always thought what, I had always thought of a scene where what if you were out to dinner on a double date and for those of you who don't know the episode, he, he finds a, a woman who he thinks is the one. And he tells us, I really think she's the one. And this is a guy who's having trouble settling down, doing anything. And so he, call, he brings her over the house for dinner, and we all have dinner. And she's great. She speaks three languages. She's awesome. And we're cleaning up, and there's a fly, and she, she kills it, and the fly, it falls on the table. And I go, oh, she, and, and Robert and Pat, uh, Deborah are in the kitchen getting the dessert. I go, let me get something to clean that up. And I go back in the kitchen with them, and they go, isn't she great? Yeah, yeah, she's great. And I turn around to see her pick yes. the fly up and eat it. Yes. So now I have to convince Robert. Yeah. And, and, and I tell him, I tell him she, you know, this, this woman ate a fly, and they think I'm drunk. Right, They're like, right. like, what are you doing, Ray? And then Robert has a long speech about, uh, um, I know what's happening now. You're yeah. jealous. You're yeah. jealous, because for once in your life, I have something, blah, 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 and you're just jealous because... Because I found the one. And after this long speech, I, I just look at him, I go, she's not the one. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Another one that gets mentioned a lot is the luggage episode. The which baggage. Was actually, yeah, yeah, your baggage. Which was actually was uh, in yeah. Exporting Raymond. That's the episode that they tried to remake in Russia, is it? Yeah, well, they, meet, they remade all of them yeah. in Russia. Yeah, well, yeah. eventually, yeah. Um, my, that might have been the pilot one that they remade. But that was... That was based on, um, you know, we have the writers, we all would take from our lives. And one day Phil came in and said, okay, we need, uh, we need episode 11. What's going on? Anybody at their <laughs> home, anything? And Tucker Cawley, one of the writers, goes, I, I think I'm having an argument with my wife. I don't know. And he explained that they went out on vacation, came back with a l luggage. There was, the luggage was put on the staircase. And, you know, the next day, nobody had brought it up. And Tucker thought, well, I'm not going to bring it up if she's not going to bring it. And she thought the same. And the bag just stayed there. And it, nobody said anything about it. Yeah. And Phil said, okay, we have an episode. <laughs> yeah. And he won the Emmy for that. Tucker yes. won the Emmy for that one. It was a yeah, great yeah. episode. Yeah. Actually, some great acting, too, because the way you walk past that bag and refuse yeah, yeah, to take yeah. it up is, is We all brilliant. brought, you yeah. know, stuff from our house. And my wife would say, you know, occasionally my wife would say, I don't want to see this. I don't want to see this on the show. Yeah. And I would say, go cry on a bag of money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I didn't. I didn't say that. <laughs> what about your, your brother and your parents? How did they feel? My brother, 
who <laughs> was a New York City sergeant, police officer, and then Brad Garrett is portraying him in this, you know, you could mm -hmm. argue a little bit goofy, especially in year one. He was, they, again, the writers were finding out and we were over goofing him in year one. And <laughs> my mother would say to me, uh, Raymond, does he, does he have to be that goofy? Because <laughs> she, literally she said, the guys at the precinct are teasing him. Aww. And, I was, and I would say, Mom, it's not him, it's a show, you know? And it was a little bit of an issue. And then, like I said, he was a single guy. And in year two and three, yeah. when he started reaping the rewards of, <laughs> yeah. And then he met Brad Garrett, and he fell in love with Brad, and oh. he was, he was, my brother was fine, yeah. Okay, so it worked out. Yeah, and my father, my father was, everything Peter Boyle did, my father did without pants on. <laughs> yes, yes. So my father was him yeah. uh, uh, to the nth power, so he really was, yeah. he was flattered. And I will say the mother was was more based on Phil's mother, that overbearing, intrusive, okay. yeah. My mother was a little bit not like that quite. You know, my mother was the typical overprotective mother, but not like that, yeah. These characters were, were so deeply rooted and entrenched from the beginning. I remember there was an episode, it might have been a, a much later season, it might have actually been... Um, baggage, where um, we learn the history of the giant fork, yeah, and, fork spoon. and spoon. Yeah. Uh, like, was that always there, or was that something that you just had this prop on the wall that you needed to explain? It was. It was just a prop, and it, and wow. and Tucker, you know, wrote that episode. And that's one of the best last lines of yeah. the movie. Is where, um, again, for people who don't know, uh, Doris explains to Patty, um, you know take the luggage and bring yeah. it upstairs with this fork and spoon. I forget what issue it was that they had and they yeah. fought over it for years and years <laughs> and finally she wanted to be the bigger person. She says, don't let that luggage be your fork and spoon, you know? And and so she does, whatever, yeah. whatever it ends. And then the last scene is is Doris and Peter in the kitchen and she's mad at him and yelling she goes, just like the fork and spoon, it's all over again. She goes, you know what? I'm taking them. And she runs and she grabs the fork and spoon and walks out. And Peter looks and goes, when did we get those? <laughs> <laughs> I just, I think like yeah. when I was growing up, everybody had the giant wooden fork and spoon yeah. on their wall. So it was, Phil took yeah. that. I think, Phil, you know, we all yeah. took something from the set and Phil has that. Oh, he kept it? Yeah, oh, I'm pretty that's sure so he has cool. that. Yeah, I have the couch. <laughs> I have the couch in the live in in our living room. It's I mean I mean in this in, on the TV yeah. show the, the couch in front of the TV set. I have that in my house. Yeah. Are people allowed to sit on it? Yeah, or? they kind of do. Yeah. <laughs> it's not. It's it's in the um, screening room where we watch football. You oh, know. Oh, okay. So my some of my kids' friends sit on it when they want to get lucky when they're losing or something. You know, <laughs> I gotta get lucky. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, the show, did, I mean, it ran for nine seasons, yeah. and it was it was it was everywhere. It was so part of the. I mean, they. I even think I was think it's strange that they kind of named a show after your show with Everybody Hates Chris. Like your show was so popular, it could yes. inspire the name then, of another show. And they, yeah, then Chris Rock. Maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. Kind of weird, but flattering. I hope. Yeah, um, there's a little story to the title. I didn't want that title. The title was based on, um, excuse me, when we were writing the pilot episode, um, they, we needed a working title. And I had told the story about my brother being a police officer and this kind of humorous jealousy between us. And he would come home and he would come to the, the house. You know, I would, uh, uh, you know, I was living at home at the time uh, doing stand up and he would see like an award I got from the cable ace people, whatever it was, I don't know. And he would compare our two lives, and he goes, look at, look at this, I go to work, you know, people shoot at me, people <laughs> yell at me, people curse at me, and Raymond goes to work, and everybody loves Raymond. Yes. <laughs> so I told that story to Phil, and he says, well, we gotta put that in. And then he said, let's use it as the working title, and I said, please don't, <laughs> because I don't want that you know, I'm a, I'm a self-deprecating, yeah, everybody yeah. loves me, I'm going to have to live with that. And he goes, no, 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 we can change it. 
that's just a working title. Mm-mm. And I said, okay. And sure enough, CBS uh, fell in love with the title. And I explained to Les Moonves, he was the president at the time of CBS, and I said, um, please don't. Um, and he goes, Ray, it's a, it's, a, it's a good title. Come up with something else, and we'll try it. And I, my, my manager has this little piece of paper because I desperately wrote <laughs> titles. And, I, and my manager told me, you got to keep your name in the title because it's a good brand. It's a good, good for you, you know, the, the Drew Carey show, Seinfeld. You got to keep your name in the title, Roseanne. So I came up with these, the lamest ones you could think of. And he has them framed. It's like that Raymond guy. <laughs> um, I remember some of them. And I remember one in particular. Um, Raymond, U-M, comma, Raymond, yes. Uh, yeah, that Raymond tree, you know, like for the family. And, yeah, they were horrible. And, and Les Mova says, all right, we're going to test them. And they did it, they put them yep. in front of a testing audience, and of course, they came back, no, oh, everybody loves Raymond Tessa. And then I said to him, just joking, I said, I was trying to appeal to him, I go, Les, you don't understand, this is going to be a top ten show, I'm going to have to live with that title for the rest of my life. And he said, Ray, if it's a top 10, when it's a top 10 show, you can change it to whatever you want. And of course, in year two, <laughs> I said, well, how about it, Les? And he said, well, you can't change it now. Now it's year two. <laughs> yeah, yeah now, we're, now we're in, yeah. yeah. But, it was, it, you know, people still, yeah. in, in reviews or whatever, not everybody loves Raymond, you know, all that stuff. Which yeah. is, you know, I'm not complaining, I'm not complaining. But, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's, well, it's funny, too, because people want to say, like, oh, I love that guy. But then they're like, wait, no, I can't say that. So they say, like, that guy's spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, was there sort of a moment when you realized, like, the show had become part of the pop culture vernacular? No. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, you know, you're always insecure. You're always, and, and, and again, we're on when Friends is on. We're on when Seinfeld's on. You know, we're doing well, and we're we're doing great. I mean, we're top 20 show, you know, a couple times top mm-hmm. 10, a couple times, you know, um, um, but y- you're always wondering, you know, when's it going to fall, when is it going to yeah. end, um, I, it's odd that now, now I, I see that people, like I say, now that I'm removed from it, mm-hmm. I, I get it a little more now, you know, I mean, I can still see, look, it's not for everybody, sitcoms aren't for everybody. The genre isn't for everybody. You got to be broad. You got to be a little bigger, and and I get it. But um, I think we did a pretty good job of adhering to the genre, but trying to keep it grounded as much as we could. Even though you know, it it wasn't until I did the next show, Men of a Certain Age, that I thank you that I realized. (laughs) Yeah, but I wanted to keep it here, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And, and not have to perform out t- to the audience, uh, you know, like a play almost. Uh, uh, because you mentioned it, we have so many questions about men of a certain age. Um, it says Tim and Jennifer, is that correct? Or jo- oh, yes. They want to know what happened to my husband's favorite show, Men of a Certain Age. We loved it and we loved all your work. Well, before we even talk about it, let's just talk about Andre Brower. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was... Unbelievable blow. I found out um, yesterday I was doing an interview, and the guy I did the interview with was about to write the obit. So he said, I feel like I need to tell you this because it'll be weird if you mm-hmm. read it. Yeah, so he told me, not during the interview. We weren't. Oh, we okay, weren't, good. <laughs> no, 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 not, not on air or anything, yeah. Because I've seen uh, that happen. Yeah, no, I, it's, it's happened to me before. But no, 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 no. This was off the record, you know. But it, oh, it's such a blow. I, I Listen, we played friends on the show. We played best friends. We were friends off. Since then, our lives go different ways. We keep in contact mm-hmm. here and there, an email, but we, we weren't close. But when he told me that, I just felt like I, I lost a friend. I felt like I lost a best friend, yeah. And he was so, <laughs> it was funny, because when we, when we uh, met with him, Mike Royce and I, he was a writer on Raymond, so we created Men of a Certain Age. So when we were casting that role, Andre Brower came in. He lived in New York. He flew here, and he met, met with us. And he didn't read. He just met. And, you know, when he left, we said, he's so good. But we, we've never seen anything comedic from him, you know? 
So we actually, we Googled Andre Brower comedy and we stumped Google. <gasps> Google said, like, you win. There's, <laughs> <laughs> there was nothing there. Um, but we ultimately said, let's go with the best actor. You know, let's go with the best actor because the show is going to be grounded and the comedy is going to be real anyway. So that's, that's all we need. Yeah. And he was so good at it. And, and then when we would improvise, like we would do two or three takes, and then I would tell him, okay, we're going we're gonna to go off script now. He would get petrified. Yeah. Yes, he would be like, and he would joke around. He would go, I revere the writer. I revere the writer. You know, and I would go, just relax. Don't worry. You'll be fine. And he was awesome at it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And he was great. Look, look, to be a great actor, to be great, have a great talent, that's good. It doesn't really mean a lot to me unless your, you know, your soul and your spirit is the same, is equal. And he had it all. He had it all. Yeah. I, w I do remember, I mean, just last week, I remember you saying that, like, he was one of the best improvisers you'd ever seen, even though he didn't want to do it. Yeah, well, he first. was, he was, it was, what was great was we would tell him, uh, when we were improvising, we said, what about this line? And he goes, yeah, okay. And, and we, in our head, heard the line the way a comedian would say mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. And he would say it with such a different spin on it, yeah. and it would work just yeah. as good, you know? So he was coming from this, and he and and the and the just the dialogue we gave him, mm -hmm. you know, the real written dialogue. Whatever we wrote sounded so brilliant, you yeah. know, sounded like Shakespeare coming out of his mouth. Yeah, oh, it's so uh, such a tragedy. Yeah, there's actually, if I may be so bold, there's a wonderful SAG after a conversation online that I, I did with um, Andre Brower in, in the pandemic, so it's virtual, and it's it's fascinating because like I'm kind of joking around because we're talking about Brooklyn Nine Nine, and he is everything he says even to like the silliest question is so insightful As, yeah. and thoughtful has such like gravitas yes, to it. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. and like you know we're talking about like he, he and terry cruz danced to salt and pepper and yeah you know what i'm talking about in one episode he's like well you know approaching that i wanted to be the finest dancer i could and i was just like you're amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's the way he was yeah it's yeah. so rare to have like do you know to, to get on a a beloved show, but you've actually had a few. And Men of a Certain Age, I know, was your, your first follow-up. Well, to I don't know, beloved. We won a Peabody Award, and then a month later, we were canceled. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which kind of the Peabody Award yeah. is a little scary, because it means kind of means they like you, but yeah. nobody's watching. But yeah. people still talk about it. Yeah, to this yeah. day, it's, I mean, it's one of my favorite things we've done. Yeah, yeah. 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 Did I you... wish we had a little more time with it. Yeah, we had two. See Look, I got to give. We were on TNT, which really it wasn't that great a fit, but at least they put it on. Yeah, yeah. 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 Do you do you still find people want to come up and talk about that show? Because uh, that comes up. Yeah, yeah. Men of a certain age comes up. I, yeah. I mean, I'm guessing it's Raymond first of all. Yeah, it's the most I mean, popular. Yeah, yeah. people uh -huh. on the street are yelling out Raymond, but, but <laughs> there are guys who say, "I love that. I love that." Yeah. Men of a certain age. Yeah. But they're yelling out Raymond, but it's also your name, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, weirdly, when Woody Harrelson was doing Cheers, I remember him saying that when people would yell Woody at him, he could tell if they were yelling Woody the character or Woody like, hey, Mr. Harrelson. I don't uh, know if it's the same for you. Um, well, when they yell Raymond. Yes. I, I know they're, they're taking it from the character on the show, mm -hmm. you know, because Raymond is such a dorky name you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah I mean look I'm fine I'm yeah. fine I, I can't complain about people loving you know yeah uh, it's our it's my leg it's part of my legacy and I'm proud of it so yeah uh, you waited some time before oh sure I'm not gonna step on yeah. someone's applause yeah, yeah that was you, terrible of you. me thank you so I thought that was applause, but then I thought someone was opening a bag. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> right. yeah. Um, you actually waited some time to branch out into films. I mean, you were probably so busy with Everybody Loves Raymond. But I think your first movie, um, aside from Ice Age, obviously, uh, is, was 2004's Welcome to Mooseport, which happened to be Gene yes. Hackman's final film. <laughs> yes. Well, I love that movie. No, I know, I know, I know. Uh, reminds me of the town I grew up yes, in. Yes, yes. I look, I went in there thinking this was going to be great. And it was, you know, it, the critics didn't think so. Uh, I, I will quote a critic. I got to give this guy credit. 
uh, one of the reviews I read, because I read it, I read a lot of them, and one of them said, um, Ray Romano is a TV vampire, and 18 millimeter film is his sunshine. <laughs> oh man, that's, but that's so clever. It's clever. No, that's that's just bitchy. That, that, um, I feel like that person had been holding on to that and waiting to use it. Yeah, and well, found a well, <laughs> you write reviews, right? No, no, I actually don't. Oh, you because don't? I feel very strongly oh, okay. that, like, because that's you're right, yeah. though. I think I think critics lick their chops when they know it's going to be a bad review. Yep. Because they can be funny then. They can yep. be biting and sarcastic and all that. Um, when they're writing a positive review, it's just all accolades yeah. and positive, yeah. But look, the f I, I'm, I'm okay with the film. It, it didn't get received as well, and people didn't go see it, but it was, it was a great experience. You know, Gene Hackman, yes. yeah. You got to work yeah. with Gene Hackman. Yeah, yeah Gene Hackman was... Um, so it's the first movie I'm doing, and... I'm working with Gene Hackman, so I'm scared, of course. I'm scared, no matter what. I'm scared now. I'm scared right now. <laughs> Stop looking at me, this guy. No. <laughs> um, but, uh, so the fir it's in Canada. We're filming in Toronto. And uh, we're having a, a dinner the night before we start shooting. The, the director wants a dinner of the cast members and producers. So it's a long, like, table. And he says, one by one, let's all go around and say something. I'm like, oh, God. So one by one, Gene Hackman, more tyrannies in it. You know, we go all the way around. And we come to me. And I hadn't met Gene Hackman yet. We just, this is the first night. Um, so he's over there, and I'm over here. And we could, comes to me, and I just go, well, I just want to say um, how great this is to be here. Uh, this is my very first movie. And from over there, he, Gene Hackman just goes, holy shit. <laughs> 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 but he was being he knew he was being funny so, yeah 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 but we bonded we oh. we were we were bonded in a nerd way a little bit because i i don't care um, i i was an american idol fan i used to watch american sure. idol so when we went filming in toronto uh they had canadian idol yeah american idol was on at that time but canadian idol was on so i got into that so Canadian Idol knew about it, so they would send me the DVDs the night after. So I would give them to Gene Hackman, and he That's would watch no them. And then, and then we would talk about it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> He'll never admit to it, but uh, we did, yeah. <laughs> but that was his last movie. I know. I retired him. Yeah, I was just going to say, after I working with you, he I, said it can't get better than this. Yeah, well, but I wish he retired on a movie with a higher Rotten Tomato rating. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I did mention the the Ice Age movies, and I just want to touch on that because the I, first one, I mean, they're all great, but that first one is, it makes me cry every time. And I think there are kind of some misconceptions about voice acting, like you roll in in your pajamas and you just you know work in a booth. It is actually so hard to do voice acting. Uh, um, my experience was, and again, I love the franchise. I like that my kids and I love the children love it. I love doing something like that. As a performer, it's not the greatest gig no. because creatively, and I guess that depends. That can vary to different movies, different mm. ones. But in my experience, I did five of them, and I was never in the booth with another actor. Yeah. Never. It's hard. In five movies in the booth. So it's just reading piecemeal. Piecemeal, you know, you're reading page one, then you're reading page 58, then, and then you're going back, and then they're telling you, okay, now you're sliding down a hill, and there's a dragon coming after you, you know, and so it's that way, and so it's not easy, and you can't, you know, the mic, they go, oh, right, do the same line, but you moved your head this way on the mic, you know, a little bit, um, so it's hard to, to just free up a little bit. Having said that, I still, I'm still yeah. proud of it, you know, and you're right, the first one was the best one. <laughs> just makes me cry every time he takes the spear. Yeah. I don't need to reenact Ice Age for you. Sorry. Yeah. Um, question about some of your other TV work from Grace. Um, what was it like having a blow-up doll as a co-star? This is made for love, I presume. Um, okay, first of all, who's Grace? Where's Grace? Okay. <laughs> Did you see the show? Oh, yeah. It's not a blow-up doll. <laughs> it's a real live. My wife used to say that to me. Would you have scenes with your blow-up doll today? <laughs> And I used to say it's it's a it's a I mean it's a ten thousand dollar 
uh, what, synthetic partner is what they call it. <laughs> yeah, I know it's easy to, to say blow up doll because uh, synthetic partner, who's going to say that? Um, <laughs> but, Sounds um, so much classier. Yeah, but they cost like 10,000 bucks. They're crazy. Um, I took that home with me. No, I didn't. No, I, didn't. <laughs> I was going to make that joke, and I was like, no, I didn't. Nope, no, nope. I didn't. Inappropriate. Uh, um, you can say it. <laughs> but um, it was crazy and weird, but it was uh, oddly, you know, it was such a, a challenge that it was fun. Yeah. You know, to, to become this guy who was having this relationship. If those of you don't know, Made for Love was the show, and uh, Kristen Mil- Miliotti is my daughter, and she's the star of the show. And I play her father, who's a bit off a little bit and uh he's been through a rough patch you know and he, he takes up a relationship with one of these synthetic partners uh, but it's real it's real to him yeah. and he gets emotionally attached and she fills a, a gap you know um so yeah once i just kind of figured out who that guy was i just believed that that this i that i that i imbued is that the word mm-hmm this this doll with these characteristics that were, was having a relationship with me. And um, I, I remember I had one emotional scene at the end when I'm saying goodbye to her, because uh, I'm going to spoil it because you guys aren't going to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> he's about to die, my character. Um, and uh, or he's, he's going to end his life because he is about, he's terminally ill. And he, so he's saying goodbye to her. and. I, I was surprised how easy it was for me to tap into it. Yeah. Because I, I really believed my character, you know, that, that she gave him something. Yeah. 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 No, it's actually, it's such a good performance because what you do is you actually make her a character, even though you're acting yeah. opposite, a, sorry, what is it, synthetic partner? Synthetic okay. partner. Um, like, you're acting for both of you. It's, it's sort of like, this is maybe not the best comparison, but it's Tom Hanks and Wilson. Yes, you know, your yes, heart is yes. broken when Wilson yes, yes. leaves because th- they have created. Having said that, you know, it's not like it's not weird. It is a little weird. <laughs> there was one time I used to do in my, I used to say in my act, uh, uh, I don't know how it, how it came up or in an interview, I used to say, if my father hugged me once, I wouldn't have to do any of this shit, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, they say, why did you become an actor, you know? And I remember one day on the set, so... This is what it was. I'm under the covers. She's laying in the bed, the doll. And I'm under the covers. Uh, I'm halfway down the bed. So I'm not going to fill in the blanks for you, but I'm down there. <laughs> and I'm waiting for action. I'm waiting for action. So they go, OK, all set. So I get under the covers. And, and something happens out there. You know, uh, they're getting set. I'm waiting for action. Waiting for... And for two minutes, I'm just <laughs> under the covers. And that popped in my head. Just one hug, Dad. That's all it would have took. <laughs> one That's hug. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, in that vein, I want to talk about some of your other co-stars um, because we talked about The Irishman earlier, which finds you sharing scenes with Joe Pesci and Robert De Niro. Yeah. Um, you've worked with Gene Hackman, so yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, I imagine this, you're not intimidated easily. Yeah, this was... I know you're being facetious. Well, kind of. How do you say it? Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm dumb. I'm a dumb. I'm a dumb. I'm the small. <laughs> we, we they used to have play a game in the writers' room. You know, in Raymond writers' room, they're all most of them are Ivy League guys. You know. Yes. And they used to play. They used to tease me. And whenever I would say a word like that, pronounce it wrong, they would write it on the board. And yeah, they had. Oh, we were all friends. We was all it was great. But then whenever I would say a word that would surprise them that yes. I got it right, I had a list right there. Nice. And we would wait to see which list got longer by the end of the year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that was pretty terrifying. Because, like I said, that was when Scorsese cast me without yeah. seeing me do it. And De Niro, you know, I never met De Niro. Pesci, believe it or not, I knew him from my golf course. He belongs to my oh, golf cool. course, yeah. And I, I performed, I, I played in one of his chari- golf charities. So having said that, you're still always scared of Joe Pesci. Yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? Of course. Yeah. I'm just going to tell a little funny side story. Uh, you are always kind of scared of Joe Pesci. You know what I mean? Yes. No matter how, yeah. And the other day I saw him and he told me once uh, that 
every day he ate a bowl of blueberries and strawberries every day for 35 years. So I saw him the other day on the golf course, and I go, and, and you know, he, he, he's 80 he's something, you yeah. know, and he's still spry. And I go, Joe, are you still eating those strawberries and blueberries? He goes, yeah. I goes, you told me you ate them every day for 35 years. And he goes, every day. I go, every day? And he just looks at me, he goes, every fucking day. <laughs> I said, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, he looks great. That's what great. I mean. And he wasn't yeah. trying to scare me, but he did. What's that? What <laughs> he looks great in his 80s, so maybe yeah. blueberries yeah. or strawberries well, every day course. is the solution. Of course, brain food, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I, that was frightening. And, and De Niro, I've, I've told this story before, but I'll tell it. It was day one, uh, not day one, but it was my first scene with De Niro, uh, big scene, and it's where I'm just sitting across from him. And I'm a lawyer, and he's... You know, he's the young De Niro. I mean, not in front of me, but he's he's playing the young De Niro who's uh, in the Teamster Union and he's got to go on trial for punching the guy. So I'm going to be his lawyer. So I'm I'm asking him, okay, did you do it? Did you do it? We're back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's a big scene for me. Um, and Scorsese's there watching. And, you know, by the time we do this side and that side and here, it's three hours we're there, back and forth, back and forth. And I, we rap, it's end. We get up. And I don't, look, you don't have to tell me, hey, that was great, but I felt like I needed something there. <laughs> I needed some one of them. I needed Scorsese or De Niro to say, just to say, hey, okay, right, good. You know, something. Nothing. We, they walk away. I go in the car. I'm driving to the, ho we're in Long Island. They're putting us up in a hotel. I'm driving in a hotel, and I call my wife. And I tell her, I don't know. I swear to God, I don't know. She goes, what do you mean? I go, I, he did, nobody said anything. Ah, oh, relax. You know, she's used to this, you know. <laughs> I, I'm like, no, seriously, I don't know. Um, all right, don't worry about it. We get to the, I get to the hotel. I'm checking in to the lobby. This is about an hour and a half after we wrapped. And I'm, I'm in my head. I'm going nuts. And then I hear, hey, Ray. And I turn, and it's De Niro. He's about to check in, too. And he's got his guy with him. And I go, oh, hey. And he says, nothing. He walks over, grabs me, kisses me on the cheek, walks away. <laughs> yes. Now, it's a mafia movie. So, right. So, yeah. But then I went into my room. I called my wife. I go, I think I'm okay. Yeah, I think yeah. I'm okay. Yeah. And you're still here. Yeah. He was fun, though. He doesn't, he's quiet guy. Yeah. And Pacino is just the opposite. Really? But they were both great yeah. you know they were both in their own way great yeah and from what i hear they're both very good about not about letting you forget that they are al pacino and robert de niro yeah and pacino there. you know like i say yeah. robert's uh, he, he keeps to himself a lot but, but there was one day where we were in the bronx and uh we were outside the courthouse and it was cold so we each had a little one of those little makeshift cabana things oh, yeah. with a heater in front of us and, you know, Pacino's here, I'm here, here. We, but we all have our own cabanas, you know. And De Niro says, let's do, let, I can't do a De Niro impression. But let's, do, let's do one of those pictures. I, I go, what do you mean? And so we did the see no evil, hear no, like, yeah, yeah Pacino's doing this, I'm doing this, and who's doing this? And we took a picture, and it's, it's got to be my favorite picture of all yeah. time. It's us three doing that. I have it hanging up, and I had them both sign it. Oh, yeah. that's so cool. Yeah. And I'm selling it on eBay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> One day, one day, not today. Yeah, he's yeah. he. It's, I love that you call him Robert because he always says, "Call me Bob." And I remember he said that to me once, and I was like, "No, yeah, I can't." Yeah, yeah. 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 you're Mr. De Niro too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, he was great. He was great. I just want to touch on um, one other great ensemble because you also received a SAG Award nomination as part of this ensemble for The Big Sick, mm -hmm. um, which is such a wonderful movie. Um, obviously, very different tone from The Irishman. Um, yeah. And it kind of brings up the, the classic, you know, it, do you find it harder to do drama than comedy? Or I think anyone who can do comedy can do drama. Yeah, that's mostly true. Yeah. 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 Um, do I find it harder? Um, yeah, I, I gotta probably, it depends, you know, I mean, there are certain types of comedy that I, that I'm not fit for, um, I'm not good at, you know, I, I, you know, you want to really scare me, tell me 
that we have to do one of those um, improv sketch shows, you know, like whose line really? is it anyway or something like that. I would faint. I would be petrified. Yeah. But you improv. Yeah, yeah but it's a difference. It's a difference yeah. than improv spur of the moment, but not when it has to be that moment, yeah. you know? Um, uh, but um, drama, it's interesting because as I get older, um, I'm feeling it to be a little bit more fun to do and more juicy to do than and less frightening than than from mm -hmm. like about 10 15 years ago. I don't know I don't know if that's just the way it is. You know, you have more life experience you can draw on. Uh I, I like to write a back, you know, uh, 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 <clears throat> the backstory for each character and it always involves my father. It always involves my father. Yeah, yeah. yeah. None of your characters were hugged. But that helps. Yeah, none of them were hugged. Yeah, no. Yeah, well, one day I got to do with a, a mother, a negligent mother. But it's always the father. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do. I, 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 I am not as terrified doing drama. I'm, but I'm still think I'm learning. I still of think I'm, I'm, I'm growing as a dramatic actor. Uh, I, I don't know if you could talk about this or, but I believe it was announced today you're doing a new series with Liz Feldman. Yeah, that came out already. Is yeah. that a, is that dramatic? Uh, it's a dark comedy, but I okay. think it's, it's a more of a dark, dark dramedy, really. Okay. You know who, she wrote, um, Dead, Dead to, to Me, me. Yes. Dead to Me. She created Dead to Me and now she created a new one. And we, I was casting it, you know, before the strike. So we were supposed to go oh. in, we were supposed to go in July, in June, yeah. Um, and I think, I don't know, I'm probably going to get in trouble. I think, can cut it out later. I think Lisa Kudrow is, is <gasps> cast as my wife, but it's an ensemble. And, and, um, uh, Linda, what's her name? Who? Cardellini. Cardellini. Yes. yes. She's in it. Cause she was in the other show. Also. Yeah. She's in Dead to Me. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I used to do improv with Liz like 20 years ago. Oh, did you yeah, really? It's so yeah. crazy to yeah, see. Yeah. No, I've never met her till she, she, we met for this. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's so exciting. Can I tell you a Holly Hunter story? Please. Yeah. No, absolutely not. <laughs> she intimidated me also, you know, um, you know, she's Academy Award winner and she was very professional and very, she was focused and you know a little bit i don't know if she was methody or whatever but she was in it but still collaborative still warm and, and everything you know but i was intimidated around her you know and then this is in the big sick and then we're filming in new york and i'm gonna go uh about day four i was gonna go do a set at the comedy cellar and so she came she, I guess, you know we, we worked it out and she came with her boyfriend so she watches me at the cell, they introduce me, and I go, and you know, that's, that's where I feel comfortable on, on stage. And I got the best backhanded compliment from Holly Hunter. I come off stage and she goes, she goes, wow. She goes, that was good. She goes, that, that was, you were different up there. She goes, you were a man up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I said, well, what have I been so far? Yeah. That's amazing. But, you know, my character in the movie yeah, yeah. is a little bit, uh, you know, yeah, she's, she's kind of the boss in the movie. <laughs> you know, yeah. By the way, I remember uh, something I remember very vividly about uh, uh, around the time around th that Big Sick was coming out is that everybody in that cast seemed to have a Ray Romano impression that they would regularly bust out at Q&As. Yeah. It, it's, it's pretty easy, yeah. <laughs> It's pretty common now. Kevin James uh, used oh, yeah? to used to get me with it. John Hamm did it once on um, on the Tonight Show, and so when I went on the Tonight Show, he, they asked me if I did a John Hamm impression. And but what I would said, that be? Yeah, I yeah. don't know. Look how cool I am. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like John Hamm, by the way. I get along no. with John Hamm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a little bit cliche now to do to, to do my imp impression of me. You know? Okay, well, it's the highest. You just form take of Kermit Frog and you speed it up a little or slow it down. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It means you're distinctive. My voice gives me away a lot. Yeah, you know, yeah. when I'm trying to be incognito, the voice always gives yeah. me away. Yeah. Uh, this leads us to somewhere in Queens, and we have a 
comment question from Judy. Um, I recently saw somewhere in Queens, so good, so intense and sweet, and you directed it. Was it difficult acting and directing, especially the intense emotional scenes? Well, I, I, um, I'm going to name drop. <laughs> Actually, what happened was when I was, we were looking for producers, I, I sat and met with two different producers, and one of them was, uh, I'm going to forget his, I forgot his name, but he produced um, A Star is Born that, that Bradley Cooper did, you know? And when I was talking about that with him, about directing myself, he goes, oh, Bradley did it. He goes, here's Bradley's number, call him. We didn't, I didn't choose him as my producer, but I did call Bradley Cooper. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we talked a little bit about it, about about you know directing and he was very I got to give him credit you know he gave me time and everything and he just said you the one of the big things is have have someone you trust who's also there and I had my co-writer Mark Stegman you know and we lived with the script for it took longer than it should have but four or five years we lived with every ounce of that script you know uh, and every inch of it and then so. I would tell him, hey, keep an eye on what's going on here. And he would tell me, he would tell me, that's good, but you know, this and this and this. And he would give me notes, you know, if, if, I, if, if he needed to. Um, so I trusted that, you know. Um, so it was a little weird, but after a, a few days yeah. of it, it became pretty normal, yeah. And I know that I, I think all films are autobiographical to some degree uh, to filmmakers, but but you really did draw on your life from yeah. the story. Um, I think everyone has seen it, but no, um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, Santa, Santa Claus, <laughs> uh, Santa. How could you? It's all right. It's on Hulu. It's on Hulu. But it's about yeah. a family from Queens. Yeah. Um, with well, I should let you explain it. Why am I explaining it? Well, it was. When I, when I decided to write a script, I didn't really know what story I wanted to tell. And I, I took Mark Stegman in. He was a writer on Men of a Certain Age. This is how long, far ago, mm -hmm. we started this. When Men of a Certain Age got canceled, I said, you want to write a script together? He said, yeah. And then we, we would procrastinate, put it down, pick it up, put it down. He got a job, I got a job. So it took a long time. But I didn't know what story. All I knew was I wanted, I knew the world. I wanted it to be these... Italian working class, Italian Americans working class from Queens. And not so much, that's what I was, but not so much uh, the people you see in that movie. I married into that, mm -hmm. that. You know, my parents were born here. My wife's parents, right off the boat, um, didn't speak English, uh, opened up a fruit stand. You know, work was everything, family was everything, the dinners, at the, the, the old school, old country traditions, Sunday at noon is dinner, you know, yeah. So I said, and, and everything is a uh, catered hall, everything. <laughs> a, a, a confirmation, catered hall, Sweet 16, yeah. catered hall, you know, everything is Leonard's of Great Neck for everything. Um, and it's like a wedding. And I had to go to those when I was married. You know, I was married a long time. I've been married a long yeah, time. I was still, say, married. still married. Still married, yeah. yes. <laughs> yes, still married. Even though... Yeah, I don't know if you saw, I, I told this story on Kimmel. I married a long time, even though my wife said, to, said this to me the other day. I, I, I always take quotes from her to try and make it into comedy, but this is true. She said, you don't talk a lot, but when you do, it's too much. <laughs> I said, word for word, word for word. Um, <laughs> I'll do another, I'll do another bit. When, when we have sex now, my wife, <laughs> let me just say it. When we have sex now, it's a joke I wrote. My wife actually has to um, take off her Apple Watch because it keeps going, time to move, time to move. <laughs> I apologize, I apologize. <laughs> Even, come on, Santa like that one. Um, but, what were we saying? Oh, the family, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I wanted her to do it about that story. And, and so at the time, I'm, I won't make this a long answer, but my son was graduating high school. My son is six foot five. He, he played at varsity basketball high school. I, I would get a thrill watching him. When it ended, he was, he was going to go to college, but we knew he wasn't going to play basketball. 
it was sad for me. I was, I was going to miss it. I was going to miss sharing it with him. And if, as pathetic as it sounds, I was going to miss the attention that I got. I, I didn't get enough attention. I, I needed to get attention in a gym, you know? Yeah. Um, but I thought, what if this is the story? This is a guy who has nothing else besides this. He feels very small in his life. And we put it in this world. And that's where we started from. And, and you know, then we added other yeah. things from my life also. But, yeah. I mean, your character, Leo, um, you, you surrounded yourself with this amazing cast, including Laurie Metcalf as his wife, Angela, uh, Tony Lobianco yeah. as his father, Sebastian Maniscalco as, as, as his brother. Um, I think one of the best things a director can do is put together a cast like that. Um, were you, and as the director, I'm imagining you were super involved with this. Oh, yeah. It was, yeah. All, it was all me and Mark. That was <laughs> it, yeah. I mean, the produ our producers, they were very uh, uh, part of, they were a big part of it, and they would give their opinions, but it, it all, you know, it all came down to us. Um, so, yeah, like Scorsese, to quote Scorsese, he said, the most important job a director can do is casting, you know. Um, and, yeah, I mean, you know, you get Laurie Metcalf, I, I think we're halfway there, really, you know. Um, just get the rest of them. And the kid, you know, it was hard to find a kid who could play basketball. Yeah. The actors, um, we wanted to make him six foot five like my son. And then after, literally after three days of, two days of casting, we said, okay, scratch that. He can be <laughs> any size. Because first of all, to find an actor who also plays basketball, because we wanted it to look authentic and look like he, he would get a scholarship somewhere. And that was hard enough because the, the casting director would send us, you know, uh, uh, 10 reels and we would look and we would narrow it down. Okay, these five, can they play basketball? And their agents would say yes. <laughs> of course. And then they would send, a, we said, can they show us a video? And they would send a five minute video. And within 30 seconds, you saw he never played basketball before this kid, yeah, yeah. It was hard. And then we found this kid who uh, was driving Postmates when we told him he got the, he got the gig, yeah. He was, uh, you know, he, 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 all he had to show us was college uh, wow. stuff he did. And he was a great kid. And then um, the, 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 his girlfriend, she's done a few things. Yeah. But she was still, she's still a good find, though, you know. Um, and then Sebastian. And then my buddy, John Manfalotti, who, if you know Men of a Certain Age, he played the bookie in Men of a Certain Age. And he played Gianni in Raymond. He played my friend. You know, I, I, he's, I have to give him work. I give him work. <laughs> <laughs> He, he's my best friend, and, and he opens for me, at, uh, I, you know, when I play Vegas, he's my opening act still, yeah. And uh, I believe you always intended to star in the film, but you had no intention of directing. No, I wasn't going to direct. No, I, I had no intention, and I didn't until very late in the game. And my agent kept trying to convince me, you know, it's too personal. Why give it to somebody else? And I said, why? Because I, I had never directed, and I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm being honest, technically... I don't know a lens from a microphone, from a thing. I don't know that. I know, again, I know every inch of every character and every motive and every tone that I want, but I don't know how to light it. I don't know what. And, he, and my agent told me, he, he's, he's Chris Rock's agent. And he said, Chris Rock's the same way. He, he did four or five movies. He doesn't know anything. He surrounds himself with a good AD, a good cinematographer, you know. And collaborative, you, you work with them, and that's what I did. I found, I found a cinematographer who, um, you know, could hold my hand, and, and I could tell him I wanted. We, we watched the movies together, and I would say, "This is the look, you know, the, you know, this tone. The uh, I don't want it any brighter than that." And he goes, "Yeah, I get it, I get it," and he was great. He, he you know, he was, and 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 he was a first time feature film direct, yes. uh, cinematographer. He had done. Uh, music videos and commercials and all that, but everyone had told me about him. The Safdie brothers told me this is the guy. This mm -hmm. is the guy, you know. And he was. He was really great. Yeah. When you made the decision to direct, were you, you you still struggled with that though, didn't you? You, you I believe yes. you talked about having panic attacks and really not sure you you wanted to do it. Yeah, I was very nervous. I went. We flew to New York and we started prep in February, and on day three. I had to go to my cardiologist and get on the treadmill because I was having anxiety, chest pains. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not kidding. I had to, 
I, my wife had to drive me there. And I was like, well, how am I? We had nine weeks of prep Oof. in front of us before the movie starts. Yeah. I was like, how the hell am I going to do a movie? You know, my doctor told me I was, it was all up here. Uh, he gave me little pills that I put in my pocket. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, but um, it, once, once, he, once I knew it was all mental, I calmed down a little, but it was still nerve wracking. Sure. Every day of prep, everything. And not, it wasn't until action where that's, you don't have time. You don't have time for that. There's so many people, there's so many this, there's so many questions, there's so many this. You, you jump off the cliff and, you, and you, you do it and you see if you land. And when it was all said and done, I, w I would do that. I would do a script that I wrote again. Mm -hmm. I oddly get asked to direct little, th not little things, but independent movies. I, yeah. People are asking me and I can't see myself doing that. Someone else's vision. It's just, it's it's I'm not I'm not that guy yet. Yeah. But you would be open to directing again. If I write it. If yeah. you write we're, it. We're, we're okay. trying to write another one. Oh, you are. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. We're we're in the process of writing. Yeah, we can't. It can't take five years though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> me, me and him don't want it to take five years. Because <laughs> <right? laughs> your cast really raved about you. I mean, I'm not I'm not surprised you're great with other actors, but the film also looks great technically. Tony, yeah. who who's done like over a hundred movies, Tony, Bianco, you yeah. know, said it was one of his favorite. I think he said it was his favorite experience. He said that to the crew. He said yeah. of, of my hundred movies. He said, this one was my favorite. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that, he scared me, too. You know, <laughs> any of these old school Italian guys scare the hell out of me, man. They just scare me. But he was sweet. He came to this comedy yeah. cellar, too. He told me I look like a man up on stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he did come to the cellar, though. He came to see me do comedy, yeah. Something I really love about the movie, and I think I've told you this before, is that, um, you know, uh, there, the, it, it has these family dynamics, and there are some people who don't make the best choices per se, but nobody in it is a villain. It feels, you know, mm. sh uh, the girl who breaks up with her boyfriend, she could easily be villainized, yeah. and she's not. She's just sort of doing her best. It's filled with people who are just sort of trying to do their best. And I mean this in the, in the most positive way, because some people don't like this word, but it's very sweet and very human. <laughs> is that an insult? Yeah, we Sorry. didn't, we didn't, we didn't um, do that on. I'm not gonna say we didn't do it on purpose, you know, but we wanted to give a a, a, a shot of you know humanity to everybody. Mm -hmm. Like even Sebastian, who plays yeah. my obnoxious brother, at the end, you know, you see a glimpse there of of a real guy, um, and the girl, yeah, who breaks he she she breaks his heart, but no, we didn't want her to be the villain. We that we deliberately said she's she's doing what an 18 year old does, you know, and she's actually doing the right thing. Yeah by not letting this kid fall more, more in love with her, you know? The kid was funny because, you know, this is his first girlfriend and he's a very socially awkward kid. That's the character. And when this guy, um, Jacob Ward, when his reel came in, we, we did his stuff with his hair. Oh yeah? We kind of gave him like bangs all, because when you see his reel, this kid, he's this kid's not a virgin. As soon as we look at that kid, we say, "This kid is. Who's going to believe that this kid hasn't had a girlfriend?" Right. He's he's, he's kind of chiseled and yeah, all that. Yeah. And it wasn't until we found this little stupid bang thing that we said, "Maybe we can pull it off now." You know? Yeah. But he really is the the most wholesome kid. He married his uh, two weeks after we wrapped. He married his childhood sweetheart that he was oh, dating. Oh, so yeah. sweet. Yeah, he's from Cincinnati. They went to Cincinnati and got married. Yeah. Isn't it funny how like they divorced? He left no. her. <laughs> well, now he's a big star. He's, no, he's not. No, he's not. No, he's not. Um, you're a good actor for a split second. There, I was like, oh no. Yeah, no, no. Um, isn't it funny though that how sometimes just like a thing like yeah. that, a small change of the hair or like that, yeah, yeah, can weird. make such it's a difference. Yeah, those yeah. Little, I mean, those character actors do that all the yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. Um, having worked with so many amazing directors, when you went into directing your first film, um, were there things that you sort of knew you wanted to do and also probably things you had learned you didn't want to do as a director? I mean, all look, all I knew, I knew the story. I knew I needed, you know, I wanted a certain look. And I know, and my biggest fear after all that was, how am I going to talk to the actors? How am I going to tell, you know, Laurie Metcalf, Academy Award nominated, <laughs> how is sitcom boy going to tell her, 
you did it wrong, Lori. No, I'm not. <laughs> um, and I know I've, I'm smarter than that. I know I'll give myself that credit. And I'm going to have tact and I'm going to know and finesse. But you never know with mm-hmm. actors. Tony Lobianco, who's done 100 films, you know, I, I never knew um, if, am I going to be able to get the performance, I think, you know? And it couldn't have been easier. Yeah. Couldn't have been easier. Yeah. Lori, you know, well, Lori said, I mean, she said she, I mean, at the end, she said, you're one of two directors I would work with in anything, you know? So I, I don't know if she's bullshitting or not. but well, yeah. Find out. Take yeah. her up on that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and Tony, you know, Tony became great. And, you know, my friend John, he, he has to do whatever I say anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the kids were great, too. Because, you know. Yeah, you're yeah. young. Uh, Sadie Stanley, is that her name? Sadie who, Stanley, Who yeah. plays the, the young yeah, woman. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned Jacob Ward. Yeah. They're fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And, and my, the, the actress who plays my sister. Do you, Deirdre? Deirdre? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I mean, she brought a lot of... She's improv also to it. She brought a, a, some great stuff to it. Um, we have one scene where she's talking about her brother's private area, and you know, the line was uh, that um, little dick bastard. You know, and she goes, "I'm not kidding. I've seen them both. Na-. You know, she's our sister. She goes, I've seen them both naked. Leo's is okay. Uh, uh, Frank's looks like a ring pop, right?" <laughs> So that's the line. She yeah. came in with 12 different... Wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 12 different replacements for what it would look like. I love I, that. I wish I could remember all of them. A birthday <laughs> candle, uh, a golf pencil. <laughs> yeah, she had a whole bunch. She was, she was great. Yeah. She's, she's so great on physical, too, the Apple physical? TV show. Yeah, yeah. Did, were you familiar with her work, or was that somebody you cast off a tape? Uh, we cast her off a tape, yeah. She wasn't in physical at the time. Yeah, oh, I don't right. think so. I don't you, think so. You shot yeah. this a while ago. Yeah, yeah. No, she had a tape. She did a tape in front of her Italian. It was Italian yeah. at the dinner table, and she had her, her family on the table, around the table, and it was very authentic. Yeah. Uh, I want to close out with a question from Frank. Aren't we tired? Are you people, we're all tired, <laughs> right? Hey, what's up? Wants to know um, what fuels your fire creatively and personally? Well, I mean, we're here. Right? Yeah. Creatively. Uh, you know, writing, I'll always do stand-up. I'll always do stand-up. And I get, a, I get a high when I write new material and I try it out, you know. There's that gamble, you know, you're on stage and you're doing all your tried and true material. Okay, I'm gonna do this little chunk now. And no idea if you're gonna burn in flames or not, you know. And then there's that high when it hits. And, and the same is for writing. When I write a script, it's how many writers out there? Writers out there? I mean, you know, it's torture, right? It's freaking torture. But it's so much fun when, when you get it. Yeah. You know? Like me, Mark and I, when we sit there and we're back and forth and we're trying to, and for a half hour, we're trying to figure out how to get this guy out of the room, you know, in the script, whatever. And then when we come up with something that is really, uh, it jazzes us, you know? We get, I get a little high when I go home. I mean, that's my, my creative juices there, writing and, and now maybe directing, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I might try it again, yeah. Personally, I mean, in, in, not in career-wise, um, you know, I, uh, I got my first hole-in-one. Any golfers <gasps> out there? What? <laughs> no way! Yeah, it was, it was, it wasn't, just recently, it was about nine months ago, um, but I never had a hole. I've been golfing for, wow. Jesus, 45 years. And uh, hole-in-ones, if you're a golfer, you know, they're, they're kind of luck almost, you know. But it was a 230-yard par three. Does that mean anything to you? Do you Absolutely know that? nothing. Okay, yeah. But just hole-in-one is amazing. Yeah, I hit a three-wood, by the way, three-wood, 230 yards, yeah. Wow. And I broke 80 for the first time, too. I'm, 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 yes, I'm very anal. I play by the rules. And I, I finally broke 80, yeah. So I, I get a kick out of that. My kids come with me with golf. I get, a ki- I get a kick out of watching my kids who outdrive me now, and that's fun, you know. And my wife, um, every time my wife buys a house... <laughs> <laughs> Anybody know we're in, ar- we're in Architectural Digest? Yes, I just saw this. Yeah, yeah th- this th- like just came out. My wife made us, too. She, she, yeah. We bought a house in, in the desert, and... Um, 
Nate Berkus, you know who Nate Berkus is? Mm-hmm. She, he's a celebrity uh, designer, and my wife has a crush on him. Yeah. He says he's gay, so I'm not jealous, uh, you know. <laughs> uh, um, uh, but he was great, and he designed it. And then he asked if we would go into Architectural Digest. And so, of course, my wife, she didn't allow me to say no. And uh, the, the video came out yesterday, I think. There's a 12-minute yeah, yeah. video. If you're going to see it, see the 12-minute one. They, they've done a condensed one. It's not as funny. It's good. Because I'm just walking around the house, and they're saying, and what did, when this chandelier, I go, Anna, come in, because I don't know anything. Yeah, yeah. I'm just, you know, what is this? You know, yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, so uh, what was the question? Yeah, what, uh, what, what excites you? Yeah. But, but, but actually, I want to go back to this. I want to get grandkids. That's what excites me Oh, that's next. right. You're... Yeah, I have two kids who are, are, are going to be married next year. That's fantastic. But I want grandkids, yeah. Um, I, just, I have to ask more about this hole-in-one because that's... Like... 235 yards, par three, <laughs> at, at Lakeside Golf Course, number nine. There's only been, in 100 years, there's only been like 13 hole-in-ones there. I was with my son and a caddy, and I hit a three-wood. It goes towards the pin. I never think it's going to go in. You can't see it. That's the one downside. Yeah, yeah. That far away, you don't see it go in, which is kind of the thrill, is to see your hole in one go in. But no, I just think, oh, I finally hit one that maybe it's on the green. We drive up. It's not on the green, so I assume it's over the green. I, I drive around. I'm looking in the rough. My caddy's walking up. He looks in the hole. He says, you playing a Callaway? And I say, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, it was, and I put it on video, and I sent it to... Hank Haney, you know who Hank Haney is? He tried to teach me how to golf, and it didn't really work. But I sent him that video, and yeah, it was. Not, I showed my wife, and my wife said, oh, "That's good. When you come home, there's a dead mouse in the garage." <laughs> yeah, and couldn't care less. Couldn't care less. Amazing. <laughs> Have you ever witnessed one in real life? Oh yeah, I've seen holes. Oh ones. okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Not many, but I've been in a foursome where a guy got a hole in one. Yeah. Wow, that is incredible. Yeah, yeah people sometimes go their whole life. Some people have oh. eight or nine of them. You know, it's weird. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, I want to compliment you on on your career in the new movie, which is now streaming. I'm not streaming. Sorry, is now available everywhere. But really, congratulations on the hole in one. That's so cool. Um, Can I tell you another? scary thing of course i'm about to get scared out of my mind i'm on bill maher friday yeah yeah exactly because i don't know shit about shit i don't it's it's the first guest where he talks to you oh you know? okay that's good and if he starts talking politics i'm gonna run you know how the lion ran away from the wizard and the wizard of ours <laughs> i'm gonna jump out the window yeah but i watch i'm a big fan of that show i watch that show and so he had, they asked me to be on it so i'm gonna do it friday I think the one-on-one -on -one is probably going to be... Yeah, that could be anything. Than, yeah, that could yeah, be light. Yeah. And, and the panel just, is where I'd be really No, I'm nervous. not going near the panel. I'm not going near the panel. <laughs> Actually, um, uh, going back to stand-up, um, I, I, I think it's the scariest thing to do because you can bomb and everybody does bomb at some point. Do you still have off nights? Um, I have off nights, but in other words, you're right. It's easier now for me. Yeah. Because people know me and they give you all the benefit of the doubt. You don't have to prove yourself. So if I go on the cellar, the comedy cellar, which is my club in New York, and it's, it's a full house, and it always is a full house. I don't know if anybody's been to that club, but they sell out every show. It's a small club, but that's where I started. It, I know it's going to be good because the audience is good, and they, they know me. They're, they're kind of excited I'm there. Having said that, there's still a nights where, well, that was a 7 out of 10 instead mm -hmm. of a 10 out of a 10. I don't, oh, I don't, you know, I was going to say I don't really have those, those super bomb nights, but I'm, I'm actually lying uh, because I did a charity. <laughs> this wasn't a bomb. It was a charity I did about a month ago for Shaq, Shaquille O'Neal, and it was in, uh, at the MGM Grand and it was for his foundation. And it's not that it didn't go well, it's just that it was in the MGM Grand Arena, yep. and it was just uh, people in tuxes on the floor, and way back in the stands are, are the public, and the people in tuxes were standing, it was like a mosh pit, they were standing with their drinks in their hand because Jennifer Hudson, this is who I had to follow, had just sang, and I'm telling oh, you, oh, I swear on. to God. That's a close -up. Yes, I had to follow Jennifer Hudson tearing the walls down. Um, it was like the guy, it was the guy who spins the plates on Ed Sullivan who had to follow the Beatles, you know? Goes, I did, yeah, yeah. 
Um, and it, it's not that they weren't a friendly audience, they just weren't very vocal. And it was so big that the, the laughs would come out and evaporate immediately. <laughs> You know, if, if you know stand-up, you know, not every venue is great for stand-up. Yeah. So that was a little bit of a, uh, you know, a throwback to the days when I had to do a lot of gigs that weren't great. Yeah. But it was for charity. And they were fine. They were fine. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to trash it. It was fine. No, yeah. but don't make someone follow Jennifer Hudson singing the well, song gotta... she won an Oscar for. <laughs> Come on. Although I bet she never got a hole in one, so. No, there you go. No, I doubt it. Yeah, um, again, yeah. thank you for being a great aunt. Thank you so much yeah, for being thank here. You. Have a great one. Thank you. Thank you.